Welcome to Games Now. My name is Anna Kesa Kultima and we are streaming live from the uh, campus of Alto University. Um, Alto University is streaming Games Now lecture series, an open lecture series that anybody can attend. We run game jams and then wonderful talks uh, by our industry professionals from Finland and elsewhere. Today's topic is absolutely lovely. It's about our very our uh, own uh, AAA production Returnal from Housemark, and we have a guest speaker, Evi Korhonen, today to talk about it. But my lovely co-host, co uh, Sally Park, is here again doing the live illustration also for this session. Uh, so we'll see uh, what happens. Yep, exciting, exciting. And we like we have a whole bunch of settings going on. There's PlayStation right in front of us, going to gameplay, as well as there's iPad in front of me for a live illustration. Yeah. If you want to ask any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll address them to our speaker. Um, we have full uh, set of uh, talks coming also later, so make sure that you follow our social media channels and uh, check the website for the additional info of the upcoming sessions. Should we go directly to the speak? Because yes. it's, it's already time. So yes. let's let's bring in uh, Evi Korhonen from Housemark. Welcome. Welcome. Thank to the you. Show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here today. Lovely to have you here. I'm looking forward to hear about this talk. I've been playing a little bit of Returnal and I'll be playing it live during this session. Mm -hmm. So if you want to point out <laughs> anything during the talk, just please. Um, but I, yeah. will, I will try. Um, this is, of course, every game developer's nightmare, watching someone else <laughs> play your game and just kind of like... <laughs> 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 yeah. Of course, we've we've uh, patched it and it's 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 a beautiful game and I'm pretty yeah. sure you're gonna do well. Like dying is part of the process, so you can't yeah. really you know mess this up. Yeah, I love dying in so many different games. Oh I guess. No. <laughs> that's it. Amy, what is your title at Housemark? Uh, senior narrative designer. That is very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we'll really like uh, diving today. We're diving mm -hmm. into the how to craft a haunting story yes. uh, thing. So I'm looking forward to that a yeah. lot. And also yeah. we know that a lot of games now students as well as the viewers here are very fond about narrative design mm -hmm. as well and we've been talking quite a lot about storytelling through mm. interactive games mm -hmm. so it's going to be a very uh, like topic alignment mm -hmm. with our interest and in today's topic as mm -hmm. well so we're very excited mm. Yes. And I and I love answering questions about narrative design. So if anyone in the chat has general kind of like uh, questions about that topic, you know, we can be here till nine in the yeah. evening as, well, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Like I can talk about that yeah. forever. Yeah, we can also have a Q Q and A session and a mm -hmm. follow up on our Discord server mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. if yeah. A uh, question didn't came up in your brain, or it, it didn't, you missed the time of chatting that on the Twitch. Mm. But th we also have our Discord channel, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> We can have that conversation mm -hmm. continue yes. there as well. Did you need to mention the swag thing? Oh yeah, I'm gonna mention it at at the end of oh. the talk, so oh, you have yeah. to wait for that. Yeah. I have something <laughs> to offer from the house marks uh, storage. So let's just see what happens with those mm -hmm. at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Evie has an extensive experience already in the game industry, and we are trusting that the journey today with uh, with the topic of uh, storytelling is going to be absolutely stellar. So let's, let's get into Evie uh, your talk. All yes, right. excellent. I'll take it away then. Uh, so. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my talk, in case you just somehow missed it. Uh, so it's about the storytelling in Returnal, and especially kind of like how we went about crafting its haunting story. And a little bit about me, Anna Kaisa already mentioned, but yeah, I've been in the industry now for 10 plus years. And I've done everything from mobile to Facebook games. I was there when Facebook games were cool. And uh, now recently <laughs> I've made my kind of like jump to AAA. And there on the slide, you can see some companies I work for. And you might also uh, have seen my work in some of the games called Quantum Break and Control. Also nice little tiny Finnish games that have come out in the uh, last five years or so. Uh, but nowadays I'm uh, at Housemark, And if you ha don't know about them, they were founded in 95. And that makes them the oldest uh, still running uh, game house or game development uh, company in Finland. And mostly they're known for their arcade style top down shooters and these very gorgeous particle heavy uh, VFX uh, uh, you, that you might have seen like in games like Resogun, Alienation, Nex Machina, uh, the last one before, before we made Returnal. And we're currently uh, 
quite quite small, I think, on the kind of global scale, only 75 people. That's big for Finnish standards. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so uh, Ako is already playing the game, but I kind of wanted to give you a quick story summary. Uh, so yeah, there, there will be a lot of spoilers in this talk in case you <laughs> didn't know that, but yes, well, I will surprise. spoil quite heavily uh, this game. So yeah, that's, that's you have to kind of uh, get used to that when you're mm. a professional, you seek for information, you're going to be spoiled a lot mm -hmm, in the game mm -hmm. details. So yeah. don't worry. So yeah, it's it's a little bit sad for the people who don't have access to PS5 and mm. can't kind of like get to play for themselves before this. But uh, hopefully, hopefully you've already seen uh, some of the stuff uh, maybe as, as as a let's play. So not kind of like some of this might still uh, not come as a surprise to you. <laughs> I've crashed on Atropos. Suit status operational, but my sidearm is missing. Heading towards White Shadow Broadcast. I have found a deceased Astro Scout here. Checking identification on a helmet. It's... Continuing towards the signal's origin. That's... That can't be here. So in in the game you play as Celine, our intrepid Astro Scout here, uh, just discovering her first corpse, <laughs> <laughs> and she's crash landed on this planet called Atropos, and uh, she's literally come there to search for this uh, origin of the signal that has this mysterious phase, uh, phrase that says, "Do you see the white shadow?" And that has kind of a very personal meaning to her. So that's she's very kind of like curious to find out like why it's coming from this alien planet. Yeah. And very soon she discovers Continue that she's trapped on this planet and even death provides no escape as every time she dies, uh, she relives the crash landing and finds herself back at the beginning. So uh, initially her first kind of like objective is to reach the signal and hopefully kind of like modify that to send an SOS message back to her mothership uh, in, in the hopes that uh, kind of like just getting off the planet will help. Um, that may have been hinting at that maybe it might not help. <laughs> uh, and then kind of like to kind of like more talk more about the setting. So Atropos is also home to an extinct alien civilization. You can see the ruins uh, quite extensively while you play. And Celine can kind of like start putting together what happened to them from the writings and the holograms that they left behind. And other th other kind of like a li little bit more disturbing things she finds are these audio logs from her other selves, uh, because she does realize that she is trapped in a time loop and her other selves are leaving leaving these kind of like little snippets behind explaining things or just um, detailing how some of these other selves have been slipping into madness. And then I think my favorite part of the story and the weirdest part of it all is that uh, she finds a house on the planet, and one that is strikingly similar to one that she lived in on Earth. So it's a, it's a very, very fascinating, fascinating setting. 
And kind of like when we started crafting Returnal, uh, we had kind of like three main pillars for it. It was the engaging narrative, I think, the first time for Housemark to really uh, kind of like go very deep into narrative. Uh, but we also kind of like have the our kind of trademark HM Housemark action gameplay. So lots of bullets, lots of effects, uh, lots of everything happening on the screen at once. And then the one, one kind of like uh, special sauce that makes it still uh, kind of like fresh every time is the roguelike variation. So roguelikes mm. games where you kind of like every time you die, you get thrown back to the beginning with maybe some permanent progress items uh, to kind of like make your future runs a bit smoother, a bit faster. And today, of course, as a narrative designer, I'm going to talk about mostly the narrative side of things. And kind of like I was the first team member to join. Uh, uh, first narrative team member to join uh, the development and kind of like our approach from the beginning was to keep the gameplay at the center. So we wanted to make sure that because this gameplay is so smooth, uh, kind of like, you know, it's so easy to get into the flow state with it. We wanted to make sure that the players would be allowed to stay in that flow and you wouldn't be interrupt interrupted with kind of like lots of cutscenes and cinematics and uh, dialogue or stuff like that. So we wanted to allow the player to choose when they engage with the story elements. So a lot of it is kind of like optional for player to read. There are the audio logs, but you can kind of like explore the environment as you listen to them. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that kind of like uh, the gameplay and story are a little bit on their separate tracks and players can kind of like choose when to, when to kind of like step on the narrative path, so to speak. It reminds me of Bioshocks audio logs, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, that you could just put them on and then mm -hmm. continue roaming in the in the world. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I also mentioned cutscenes already, and our kind of like um, kind of like method with them was to have as few cutscenes as possible. Uh, not just because kind of like we were a small team, and like you know making big big expensive cinematics was kind of like maybe not scope wise also the kind of like smartest thing. But it was also kind of like allowing us to focus our storytelling. So kind of like what moments are those that we really want to kind of wow the player with and then kind of like make those moments uh, so much more rewarding when you get like a big, big juicy uh, cutscene. And then uh, kind of like overall, uh, we'll talk about the kind of like maybe the confusing and um, ambiguous nature of the story uh, during this talk. But we kind of like wanted to start uh, when we were crafting the story with a version of the events. And then we started obfuscating uh, from that point onwards. So players would have kind of like multiple possibilities of how to interpret that, that story. Uh, but we're going to talk about a little bit about those later because I still wanted to kind of like talk about a little bit how to marry storytelling with uh, roguelike or roguelite maybe is the more appropriate term uh, for Returnal. And of course, the first challenge is that um, roguelikes by uh, definition are usually procedurally generated. So all of the levels here, uh, we've handcrafted each room, but uh, kind of like how we put them together uh, is often randomized. So that makes it a little bit hard to control the pacing of your narrative beats. And we kind of like decided to embrace that a uh, little bit and just kind of like scatter a lot of the puzzle pieces around and allow players to connect them. So we, there are a couple of things in the game that we do know happen in a linear fashion, fashion. But like, for example, there are players who might just, you know, just blast through to the end of the game and then look at all the narrative content like one after the other. Or you might engage it as soon as you get it. So kind of like we had very little control of when player uh, engages with that, and we had to take that into account uh, when we were looking into this. Of course, kind of like uh, if you are making your rogue like with narrative, uh, you could invest in tools and systems that kind of like ha can help. Like you know, now it's been three rooms since that last narrative beat. Drop something here. Um, but uh, we we didn't uh, personally invest in the systems like that. We decided to embrace the embrace the chaos and uh, go with the flow. Uh, then. The second problem is the uneven familiarity uh, that happens with these games is that you play the starting area like hundreds and hundreds of times potentially, mm -hmm. but maybe the last area you get to only like tens of times. So you have, you maybe become even sick a little bit of the first area and it has to be really cool and it has to be refreshed way more often uh, than the last area. So you, you kind of have to like also think about the content uh, in a way that maybe you need to put front load more of it uh, or kind of like pace it out for the beginning area way more 
uh, than you have to do for the last area. Then, I already mentioned this a little bit, is the reuse and renewal of content. Uh, roguelikes often kind of like reuse the same content uh, and kind of like find ways to make it feel fresh. And we, of course, kind of like did that as well by kind of like having, having kind of like the narrative evolve as you go along and also by recontextualizing some stuff. So you might have seen something, but you don't know yet what it does. Or you see something, but you don't have access to it yet. So it kind of like, you know, niggles at your brain like, what is that? How do I get there? And then also a lot, lot of the kind of like terminology and kind of like narrative beats uh, in Returnal in the early moments are, I think, intentionally a little bit like, I'm not sure what this means. But once you kind of like get into the story, and start to learn more about it, you start to make those connections and then you kind of like realize like, ah, oh, that's what it was all about or that's what it meant or like, oh, 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 she's that is like, you start to make those connections and it kind of like refreshes and when the next time you see that, you have that kind of like renewed, uh, renewed kind of like a knowledge about that thing and it makes it more exciting uh, to encounter, even though it's still the same thing. Now I already had my <laughs> first death. <I> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So they introduced me to the cycle. Mm -hmm. And you got to go inside the ship, which is kind of like also exciting mm -hmm. that we do kind of like first person, uh, kind of like moments in a third person game. Yeah. That's yeah. very, very nice. Yeah. I, I like it too. Um, because kind of like it also gives you this sense of like, okay, I know, or players can maybe guess that no combat is going to happen there because there is no HUD here. You don't see your pistol. And you can kind of like just focus on exploring this space and you get to see it at much more close range. So this is also a great space for storytelling. I, I get and to sleep. Yeah, yeah, now mm. you get to take a nap. Mm. I'm sure it's gonna go well. <laughs> 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 see, pleasant dreams. Mm, nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we kind of like uh, also did the, yeah, I already mentioned the revealing more information. So we evolve uh, certain aspects of the story, the more you kind of like progress in the game. And that's going to be a big part of um, the, the narrative features that I'm going to be talking about later in this presentation. And then testing is hard. Uh, roguelikes uh, are kind of like hard to test with kind of like the width of content and how many kind of like combinations of things you can have. It's already kind of like hard enough that way, but kind of like for us with the narrative pacing um, potentially being very different for many different players, uh, it was kind of like hard to test the whole whole of the game. And of course, because game development is what it is, a lot of these things come in very late. So um, testing, of course, uh, is is how you make sure that the game game is as polished as possible at the end. So you do want to do that. And then some additional challenges that we had, particularly as, as Housemark uh, uh, developing Returnal, is that we had a very small team. Uh, so we kind of like tried to uh, adjust the scope and everything to uh, our fit our core team of 75. And then of course, Sony, our publisher, uh, helped us with some external developers um, that kind of like helped us a lot of with the audio, the cinematics, uh, several, several levels and bosses. So. We, we did get outside help, but as a, for a AAA game, still, this is a, like a very, very small team. And this was, of course, the first time we had a dedicated narrative team. Uh, so we kind of like had to learn uh, how to integrate with the team, how to make sure that the narrative narrative was also uh, kind of like uh, meshing, meshing with the gameplay and just kind of like a lot of learnings uh, for the team uh, in terms of processes. And also our narrative team was also very small. So at largest, we were four people all together. And then of course, there was a little thing called the pandemic <laughs> and we had to uh, transition into remote working midway in the production, but we pulled it off. And yeah, I think we managed to deliver a game during the pandemic, which I think there should be like a special medal for that. Mm. Yeah, it's Indeed. amazing. But you got a special medal already. Yeah. Yes, one, one game of the year so far. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> that's Hopefully a big more. medal. Yes. But yeah, so back to kind of like what we wanted to achieve with the story. Uh, and this came from Harry Kruger, our creative director, kind of like his, his vision for the story was to aim to haunt the player. And what he meant with that was that kind of like 
long after the credits have rolled on this game, the game would still be on your mind and you'd be wondering, what did that all mean? And that players would have different theories and they would go online and they would kind of like fight on forums and on YouTube, like, this is the definitive story of Returnal. And that, you know, we wanted to kind of like support that experience of uh, kind of like there not being one uh, definite answer to any of this. Mm. And then we kind of like created, we wanted to create a mystery, uh, kind of like, that's that's what is kind of like happening on many levels here. What what drew Celine to the planet? What happened to the aliens on the planet? What is there in Celine's past that is still haunting her? Uh, what are all these uh, weird um, alien creatures that she keeps seeing? Like, what are they like? There are many many levels of mysteries, and we only kind of like unravel some of them. And we wanted to kind of like make sure that we're not spoon feeding the story. Like you can have a mystery story and still kind of like have all the answers at the end. But we wanted to make sure that that wasn't really what's happening here. So kind of like we give you more like puzzle pieces and then allow you to put them together however you want. Sometimes people have to break the pieces a little bit to make them fit their theory, but that's that's fine. And we also kind of wanted to make sure that there was these gaps that players could fill in with their imagination. And I've I've personally really enjoyed like listening and reading what kind of theories players have about the story because they're way better than what I could have like if there was one definitive answer. Oh, you're gonna have to use the alt fire. Yeah, but now I, oh yeah, yes. uh, now it, now I got it. Okay, yeah, I feel stupid, but yeah, uh, uh, no worries. We changed the the settings of the of the controller. The controller, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. Kind of like if there had been one definitive story and we would have only supported that in the storytelling, I think it wouldn't have been half as good as some of the stuff that I've been reading. So I'm really, really all for kind of like this um, very interpretative version of, of the story that there are multiple interpretations and we, we let the players decide what they want to believe. Oh, and no. I keep, I keep like, I, I am stuck in a time loop where I keep telling my points before I show them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so how we kind of like went about allowing for the multiple interpretations uh, was that we kind of like undermine the narrator. So there are kind of like several narrators in the game, uh, in a way. Uh, there's Celine and then there's her kind of like suit computer. And we undermine kind of like both of them in kind of like subtle and less subtle ways. So you can't always trust the information that you're seeing. We also uh, use symbolism quite a lot. Uh, oh no, <laughs> I died. <laughs> that's, yes. part of, that's part of the game, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna uh, talk about a little bit uh, about the symbolism later, but kind of like the themes of uh, guilt, loss, uh, inability to move on, and then also spoilers, motherhood, and especially being maybe not the sh brightest and shiniest example of motherhood, uh, <laughs> and kind of like strained familiar relations. Uh, those kind of like come up uh, quite a lot uh, in the story. And then there's uh, the kind of like parallels and weird connections between all these stories. So there's several story layers. There's the alien planet and there's Selene and there's lots of Greek myth references and there's these weird par parallels and maybe coincidences like, oh, this was also named like that. Or like, oh, it's weird that this, this, this text also referenced that text. And it kind of creates this little bit of sense of like uncanniness that no, this couldn't be a coincidence. Again, sometimes it also works to undermine the uh, narrators. And one thing that kind of like Harry was, Harry was also, oh yeah, this was actually on the next page. Ah. But yeah, so one thing that Harry was uh, adamant was that there would be no agreed upon story. So not even internally, like we did create a, a version of events. Mm -hmm. And then like I did created a timeline of like these events happen and then these events happen and then these events happen. But that was just kind of like, agreed that this is a version. And now that we've been talking uh, internally uh, with with uh, my team about the story, we still find sometimes we're like, no, I thought like I interpreted so that Celine was doing this. And so we're, we're still internally like um, at, at odds sometimes about what the story means. But it's great because we get to then take those opinions and make sure that the kind of like game continues to be as weird and, and as open to interpretation as possible. So the story is actually giving back to you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But yeah, so we were kind of like saying that uh, we need to have a version, like saying it's a mystery and then not doing anything on it is not enough. 
So we needed to have internally a story to work from, and then we kind of like diversified from that, that we wanted to support the theory that this is all happening in her head, or this is some weird kind of like afterlife, and Celine is being punished, or that this is an actual alien planet, and just that there are cosmic horror entities here that are just twisting and shaping and picking her memories from her mind and, and making them real on this planet. So we kind of like have our box of secrets where we're kind of like taking all these uh, kind of like ingredients and then applying them to that original template of the story and just messing messing it all up. Uh, so so it kind of like becomes a little muddied and all of those theories then become valid. And this is kind of like the story structure that we had uh, quite early on from the beginning. I've touched it up a little bit, uh, but kind of like we started building building from the central core of the story, which is Celine's backstory, her personal trauma, her loss, her guilt, her in inability to move on. And then we kind of like layered on top of that because we knew that this one, we wanted this to be a weird story where, where kind of like her past is coming, becoming real, or at least she's being reminded of it on this planet. Then we kind of like put the planet's history on top of that, creating those parallels. And then as the kind of like final outermost layer, there was the time loop uh, that she keeps dying and being uh, taken back to the crash moment of the crash. And also that the planet keeps changing. And it's kind of like, it's not just a gamified concept of like everyone has to kind of like sometimes suspend disbelief that, oh yeah, and this time the map is just different. Um, but it's actually kind of like baked into uh, the narrative that the warp something on this planet warps it like it's never the same as the last time you saw it so that was kind of like the story we built from outwards in uh no inwards to out and then the players experience it from the opposite direction so they first experience the time loop they first experience the changing environments and the the gameplay of it just run shoot and die and then they maybe start seeing uh the planet's history they start finding alien artifacts and weapons and uh, they start to maybe wonder what happened to all these aliens that had this wonderful technology, like teleportation, infinite, infinitely regenerating ammo on these guns, mm -hmm. uh, all these like massive, massive structures uh, that they created. And then you start to wonder like, where, where did they all go? Mm. And then finally you start to kind of like see, uh, uh, maybe you see the house, maybe you start to see kind of like all these personal, personal things to Celine. She might mention that this is something that only she knows. And then you kind of like, you get to the core of the experience. So we build it uh, from the core outwards. So that kind of like player gets this mysterious journey of traveling in and finding more layers, the deeper they go. And these kind of like, uh, conveniently, these circles that you see here kind of like correspond with the theme, which is kind of like Celine's, uh, Celine's story is kind of like heavily, heavily kind of like s the same as the themes of the game. Then the setting is the alien planet, and then the plot is the time loop. So kind of like we have the loop, we have the planet, we have the hero. And then these actually really nicely also dovetail with our genres, which is cosmic horror, science fiction, and a psychological thriller. So we kind of like look, looked at these genres as the story layers, and we started mixing them together. So we have the grounded sci-fi, uh, where you are a uh, scout, you crash land on an alien planet, you shoot aliens. Um, very kind of like traditional sci-fi. Then we have the psychological thriller, uh, that there are clearly elements uh, that are very personal to Selene being manifested on this planet, uh, if this is real at all. But kind of like the very, very kind of like personal nature of some of these, clearly, and how they are here in a very creepy way, um, bring that kind of like nice psychological aspect. And then there's the cosmic horror, like you are, stuck in a time loop on this kind of like really hostile planet and there's lots of tentacles not that, that <laughs> it's a kind of like a part of the genre but it's a, it's a little bit of a trope mm. uh, but yeah so when you, if you start thinking about like we don't do much horror in the game but if you started to think about the situation that Celine finds herself in it is pretty bleak pretty horrifying I guess it's a little bit normalized by games mm. uh, to have these horror elements, so we get mm. a bit different experience than what we get in movies. Yeah, but I think there there are some couple of nice audio logs that really kind of like hammer it home that this is this is a very lonely and very terrifying experience. But she's also she's also kind of like a 
really nice action hero in the sense that she, you know, gets on with things. Yeah, so here we have actually one of the audio logs. Mm. Yeah, which I is don't not know if it hears in the, it's in the yeah. stream. But oh yeah, you don't have the subtitles on. Oh yeah, I can. You I could put the subtitles I on, so them on, then so people can, can at least read it. Yeah, audio subtitles. Yeah. Subtitles. Oh, it was mm -hmm. off. Okay. Mm. Yeah, true. So I, I kind of it, well, it's super hard to mm. concentrate on a on a lecture <laughs> and uh, to talk and to mm. play. But I kind of feel sometimes a bit lost. Where should I go? Um, but you're, you're going in the right direction. So <laughs> one, one good hint that I can give you is that every time you go through a square shaped door, right. you're on the main path. Okay. If yeah. you go through a triangle shaped door, then you're on the side path. So yeah. you, you've been going through the, the square shaped door. So everything's good. 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 Yeah. There are, there are these kind of like little hints uh, if you pay attention, but kind of like it is sometimes. Yeah, I try to read it though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But oftentimes when I play ac action games, it, it's kind of hard for me to mm -hmm. also read the instructions. Yep. I just want to shoot. Yes. Yeah, yeah they, and they, there's never a tutorial about this, but it's explained on kind of like if you open up the big map mm. and kind of like uh, yeah. look at what all the different this legends one. mean, mm. then there it says kind of like main path for the square. Yeah. Good. And there's also color coding, so the kind of like the grayer door you've already passed through, but then you can look for that brighter green door, and that's the one you haven't passed through yet. Mm. But yeah, so meanwhile, back to the story layers. So as I showed in the previous uh, slide, kind of like the grounded sci-fi is uh, represented by kind of like Atropos and its alien civilization. And then we have House and Celine's past, representing a psychological thriller. And then we have the cosmic horror with the time loop and distorting of both space and time. And then kind of like the th kind of like magic sauce that I think kind of like uh, pulls it all together is our heavy use of Greek mythology. So hmm. if you don't know, Selene is the name of a kind of like Greek myth uh, goddess of the moon. And kind of like Atropos is also one of the uh, kind of like uh, figures in Greek myth. So you can kind of like go with the idea that, okay, everything on this planet is named after Greek myth because the planet is named Atropos. So it can be mm. kind of like, you know, scientifically valid that, okay, <laughs> we, we started with the naming of the planet. So let's just stick to the same naming, naming scheme. But it is also a little bit kind of like, you know, it feels maybe very weird that everything happens to be like a coincidence that Selene is here and her mm. ship is named Helios and this mm. planet is named Atropos. And, hmm. But yeah, it could just be a coincidence. And as I mentioned, uh, we tried not to kind of like keep the layers stacked neatly like a cake, but just kind of like mix, mix it and mash it all together to create this sense of a little bit of kind of dreamy space in the end, kind of like unreal sense of uncanniness and uh, unrealness to, to this place. And then we get to the storytelling techniques. So uh, we have multiple ways of telling our story and we wanted to make sure that there were multiple avenues for us to kind of like tell all these different kind of stories that are happening in the game. And the one that I already mentioned was the cinematics. Uh, so kind of like from the start, we knew that we only wanted kind of like three big cinematics. We had the opening cinematic, we have what we call the mid game twist, and then we have the ending cinematic. And there are kind of like few smaller ones like uh, we have a couple of versions of like every time you wake up or you interact with a new device for the first time but kind of like they they are more like what we would internally call like animations and not like uh, always kind of like getting the big title of a cinematic or at least not the kind of like we understood that the three big were in a slightly different category from the uh, other other cinematics. Uh, then we have what we called internally the cosmic clip. So if you've been paying attention every time Arco dies in the game, <laughs> uh, she sees these kind of like flashes of kind of like very weird disparate things. Also, when you sleep, you see those things. Uh, so we use, in, use those in a couple of places to uh, just to create this kind of like sense of, are you seeing these things when you die, when you sleep? Like it is, it is never kind of like really um, confirmed like what these things are but they just create that sense of like unease of like what are those things how did she know to put it there i guess <laughs> she she is a genius <laughs> <laughs> she knows by intuition mm -hmm. well it's already repeated so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. 
And uh, is it a little bit uncanny that all this alien technology like perfectly conforms to her suit and it's just like a mm. mm -hmm. little, bit, little bit convenient. Mm. And then we had the first person sequences. So we saw uh, Arco earlier go inside the ship, but there is also the house, uh, which is kind of like where a lot of the kind of like heavy uh, storytelling is happening. So first person sequence allows us to kind of like get closer, get up, get up close, don't have to worry about combat, but also maybe it creates this sense of unease that you're used to interacting with the world just by shooting, jumping, running. And now suddenly you can't do any of those things uh, in the first person mode. So it also creates the uh, this kind of like sense of unease in the sense like, what can I do here? Uh, am I going to be attacked here when I can't defend myself? And kind of like, what are what are the the kind of like players' confusion about like what are the how do I interact with this environment? Also, maybe reflects the unease that Celine has when she enters this house. So. There is, is there, a, is there a, like, when do I get to the house? Is uh, it like farther you, you, away? You will uh, encounter it, I think. It's still a little while away. Okay, all right. So we'll wait. We'll <laughs> wait. Uh, <laughs> and the downside is that uh, even when you see it, you won't be able to access it until you get the key. So this, is, right. this is that friction that kind of like you see something yeah. and you still don't know quite like there's a house. And it clearly has some kind of interaction marker on it, but it says that it's locked. Mm -hmm. So it get, creates this kind of sense of niggling uh, mystery that you want to figure out, like, how do I get to the house? What is inside the house? So it's like a gating uh, mechanic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of games want to do this, that they first introduce a feature to you as something that you can see from further away, or maybe you can kind of like get up close to it, but you can't use it yet. So then it creates this kind of like point in your mind uh, that, okay, I need to figure out how to get there, or how to use this. But yeah, and then storytelling techniques voiceover. So Celine um, talks, talks to herself about things she finds, but it's also kind of like there is this narrative device that she is trying to reach Astra, uh, her employer and the kind of like mothership that she arrived on. So the tiny shuttle is definitely not enough for interstellar travel. Uh, so she's trying to kind of like keep the comms open just in case, kind of like somehow uh, that kind of like message would get through. But Atropos is a very, very, very kind of like um, unwelcoming planet. And once you're in, not much gets out. Uh, then we have the audio logs that we've already uh, seen and discussed a little bit. But yeah, it's 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 kind of like a it's a very traditional, I think, a video game storytelling me mechanic. But I think it's a little bit more fun when it's kind of like your own voice. Kind of like you know that, that that is maybe, or at least it's someone imitating Celine's voice really well. Uh, so it's not just kind of like these people you've never met conveniently spouting like, oh, and then the safe number is 453, don't forget that. But it's other versions of you and you kind of like get these snippets that we probably wouldn't have been able to do without a bigger budget to kind of like explain all the different ways uh, that she manages to die on this planet and how she just slowly goes insane uh, when we can just have an audio log that kind of like gives us a shorthand uh, for all those different horrifying experiences. And then we have ship logs. Uh, so if you go inside the ship next time, we can also take a look at those in real time. Uh, but those are more like uh, uh, kind of like data files with, within the uh, computer. And there we get to, yeah, these are the xenoglyphs. I can try to die so that we can yeah. get to the ship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you will die soon <laughs> anyway. Die soon, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can up there, you can gather the first cipher there, and then you can read the first layer. Mm. And just grab that. And now if you go back to the, the stone. Ooh. Analyze. Mm -hmm. Wow, so a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, so now you're translating alien languages. Mm. Pretty neat. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, intentionally here, we put the xenoglyph first, then the cipher. Yeah. So you'd kind of like get this sense of like, if you somehow miss the cipher on the first run, at least you kind of like get this sense of like, I need to find some ciphers. Right. But if you already had the cipher, you might not connect that you mm. need them to kind of like learn to translate these um, alien yeah. writings. 
But yeah, so those were xenoglyphs, but there are other things called xenoarchives, which are these 3D holograms where we use our wonderful particle tech to tell stories. So they are kind of like these friezes or tableaus of uh, what happened to the aliens. This doesn't feel <laughs> that I'm gonna survive. Oh yeah, those those are hard, hard enemies. Now I already forgot how to <laughs> use it. <the> oh <laughs> no. Oh uh, no! Uh, yeah, because oh, there yeah, is another one. Okay. Yeah, they slow okay, you cool. down with those um, oh, okay. tendrils. So you want to keep your distance. Oh my god. There's and more. yeah, they can be unfair and teleport behind you. All right. Yep. Oh, there we go. Yep. Dying. Dying. <sighs> On cue. Just as I was thinking, like, we could <laughs> go back to the ship. <laughs> I'm a perfect uh, uh, pre player for this. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for that, the final final kind of like uh, storytelling technique uh, was the databank entries. So every enemy, every item that you encounter is also logged into the ship's computers and your suit's computers. So you kind of get to read a little bit more about them. So now if you go inside the ship. Oh, yeah. Mm. There we go. I, I really love this, the way that it, she goes in. Mm. It reminds me of something. I can't remember, like something. Mm -hmm. Maybe like getting out of the bio. Th there's a little bit of Bioshock vibe for mm. me in this game, and I don't know exactly yeah. why because it, it's not really. But there's something in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's that kind of like being stuck alone in a really strange environment. But yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's that computer. Yeah, it's, it, it can be that even though we are not underwater, it, mm. it, it has this feeling that we, I'm, I'm suffocated by something. Mm. So well done. Mm -hmm. Well, we did take a lot of inspiration from kind of like underwater creatures and underwater mm -hmm. plants. So. Yeah, and, and the colors of the scene is also mm. a little bit like aquatic. Mm -hmm. So so what do I do in the yeah. inside the ship? Yeah, so if you turn around to that monitor you were facing, then now if you press triangle, so this is kind of like an overview of everything that's been happening to you so far, how, fa how far you've gotten, how much time you've spent. And then if you press R1, you get to see the ship log. Mm. So here are a couple of files that are already open for you. And uh, then the other ones are still uh, inaccessible because the computer got damaged in the crash and it needs a little bit more time to kind of like um, untangle untangle those files. Right. Is the data bank matrix something that, that kind of, uh, as a player, I obviously uh, assume that these are the things that I need to fill this view? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, uh, yeah so that kind of like maps uh, all the data bank entries that you can't access here anymore, mm. but kind of like if you go out out of this menu and then you press the central big button on your controller, that flat. Oh, yeah, this one. Uh, or oh no, yeah. it wasn't accessible in, in oh, so you in have here. to go outside the ship. Yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, so that, that kind of like the data bank is only on your suit at the moment, but that right. kind of like tracks how far along mm. you're filling to filling the whole thing. 100 percenting. It's it's for completionists, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed, completionist mm -hmm. in me is already yes. calling. <laughs> so if I go to sleep, I get some hints about the. Mm, like yeah, you you get a you get some cosmic clips that may or may not be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> cosmic clips, I love mm -hmm. that. I, I I really love like in games uh, mm -hmm. these days. There is more of the utilizing of sleep and mm. napping. Mm. So it's a it's a good thing. Mm. to use because that's that's the dream right to be able mm. to sleep whenever you want <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that obviously ga games kind of feel weird that the mm -hmm. characters g keep on going there's mm. no nights at all yeah never sleep never eat never go yeah. to the bathroom indeed yeah. well we, we don't miss the bathroom stuff i guess no. that much uh, but yeah, so we're going to talk about today more in depth about these ship logs. We're going to talk about the xenoglyphs and we're going to talk about the data bank entries, mostly because kind of like my role in the development team was very much shepherding all the text based content. So almost every piece of text that you see on the screen was at some point approved by me. Uh, not just kind of like the narrative, but also kind of like the gameplay objectives, the tutorials, mm -hmm. everything. Uh, and the ship logs, xenoglyphs, and data bank entries were the kind of like most uh, text heavy uh, narrative content that we had. And I got to have a, quite a lot of effect on those. So let's talk about the xenoglyphs first. Uh, so, and then, then I went in the wrong direction. So, uh, kind of like within the lore of Returnal, these are basically writings left by the extinct alien civilization or kind of like one faction of them called that we call the severed 
Um, players can then translate these texts by finding those uh, ciphers, those kind of like red graffiti that you find on the walls. And each each of these xenoglyphs has three translation tiers, uh, but kind of like the amount that you need to uh, kind of like access each tier depends uh, kind of like individually on each uh, xenoglyph. So, for example, uh, they're kind of like fairly easy to get in the beginning, so requiring only maybe one, five, ten ciphers, and then towards the end of the game, they might start requiring 50, 70, 90 ciphers. So they're kind of like uh, we try to also kind of like follow players' progress and kind of like mm. calculate roughly. Where this is where it got hard because we couldn't know how many ciphers players had picked up. So we just kind of like had to make our best educated guess on kind of like how many ciphers they might have by the time they reach this point in the game. Right, yeah. Mm. And then we also kind of like wanted to make sure that they do still see those early translation layers because as we mentioned, that as we're going to see, they, they have quite a lot of way more interesting information maybe than even the final finished uh, translation. And yeah, and as a former translation student, uh, I was very kind of like um, passionate about this particular feature uh, because I've always kind of like disliked this very gamified version of translation that you see in video games. Like, oh, um, I've read five Russian texts, so now I've reached level five in Russian and I can fully and completely <laughs> translate this piece of text into perfect English. Yeah. And I, I just really dislike that. And especially since now we're dealing with an alien species that has a completely different biology to ours, completely different culture, like they would have concepts that we have no names for. So I, I really detested this idea that there would be mm. kind of like, okay, you just pick up, pick up language XP and then you completely get perfect yeah. English. So I, I come from the uh, school of translation being inherently interpretative so you can't just kind of like on off a text uh, there will be nuances variations you will insert your own subjective understanding of that language and your own cultural expectations when you're translating it into another language and we kind of like wanted to also kind of like highlight this uh that this isn't a complete understanding of the piece of text you're seeing through this uh, value that we call translation accuracy. So the computer makes an estimate like this is this is how good we think this translation is. And we play a lot around uh, with what that kind of translation accuracy is as you get deeper into the game. And uh, these texts basically in evolve on two axes. So your understanding of a single text deepens as you gather more cipher. So now you only have one cipher and you'd reach the next layer, I think, when you get two more. So kind of like then you get to unlock the tier two. And then when you have like, I think five or 10, you get to unlock tier three. So understanding of one individual text deepens the more you gather those ciphers. But then uh, overall, the kind of like style in these xenoglyphs shifts the farther player progresses. And I'm going to show you uh, some examples of that. Uh, so kind of like initially the texts talk about we. And then mm. the later texts talk about I. So we kind of like signal that maybe the writer behind these texts has shifted. And then that mixing of the layers that I talked about, the story layers, we do that. The stories of the alien civilization. But we kind of like use the, the inherently broken and kind of interpretive nature of the translation process to substitute some missing words with ones that are deeply personal to Celine. And that maybe creates also a little bit of sense of that cosmic horror. Like, why is this text mentioning stuff that is like super deeply personal, my dark secrets? So there's kind of like a lot of, lot of layers being cut through here. And then, yes. So here we have an uh, example of that text Oops. that actually, uh, this is the first one that player encounters. So this is the same that you might have seen earlier there. So here we have the full three layers. Uh, and there on the top left, you see the first layer. And we had to actually workshop quite a lot to get this kind of like text uh, in its current, in the state that you see it. Uh, because we wanted to have these three uh, formats of text. So we have those green letters or green symbols that are absolute complete jumble. Uh, then we have that kind of like bolded yellow all caps letters. And then we have the kind of like yellow small caps letters with the question mark at the end. And we wanted to use these to try and communicate different um, kind of like 
uh, certainties within the text. So the kind of like green symbols are kind of like, this is the alien text that we cannot decipher, fully not understood at this point. Then the all caps yellow text uh, bolded means that, okay, we're pretty sure that this is what this text means. And then the, the kind of small caps, uh, non-bolded question mark is kind of like, mm -hmm. we're maybe thinking that this is what it might <laughs> mean. And this is usually where you get the most interesting things because that's where you get to start putting the personal stuff from Celine. Mm. So the kind of like agitated waters, that's a little bit weird, especially when the context before is like our severed brethren, agitated waters, like that doesn't make any sense linguistically, mm. but that's what the kind of computer is spitting out. And then in tier two, now we see that kind of like there's less unknown spaces. There's just a couple of spaces with the green uh, symbols. And now we see much more of the kind of like certain translation appearing, but it's still like now it has octopus upstairs and seizures. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are kind of like, again, really weird. And especially they seem to have no connection to the final translation, which is our connection to our brethren is severed. Our agony is maddening. We cannot stop the endless cycle of violence to come. And none of this seems to have like any connection to agitated waters, seizures, octopus upstairs. So it's again kind of like trying to set that little bit of unease of what, why, why mm. is the computer telling me these things? Like that mm. doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem like I want to trust that computer anymore. But is it so that this would still mean in the grander, pic like mm. in the grand picture, the, the yep. misinterpretations of the yes. text? Okay, that's Yeah, so beautiful. for example, the octopus upstairs is a uh, reference to something that you will see in the house in the future. Right. So yeah. hopefully, like we also yeah. wanted to do a lot of intertextuality. So mm -hmm. a lot of these kind of like different texts are in conversation with other texts within the game. So kind of yeah. like we have a lot of references to other things and a lot of repeated phrases. So yeah, it yeah. also becomes like really uncanny. Like, why is this thing also here? Like, how does this, how does this computer, like, it's very unlikely that you would mm. see this uh, or kind of like in terms of chronological things, like it's, it's possible that you could see this octopus upstairs before you go to the house, mm. most likely, because it's always there on your main path and you will probably very easily collect those ciphers and then you'll have seen octopus upstairs before you as a player have seen the octopus mm -hmm. upstairs. I, I kind of feel like that the future uh, translation technology adapting to me somehow <laughs> would work exactly this way. <laughs> that it had, had my traumas or things yeah. that I've experienced before and they it, would it be... It would be Google AdWords. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. Well, welcome to the future, I guess. Yes, yeah. yes. We've tested all these sceneries that, <laughs> for instance, a lot of pandemic stuff has already happened in games. Yeah. So, yep. so yeah, uh, it, it was it really weird also working on a time loop game in 2020, <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> I made the joke like, yeah, yeah, I've been stuck in this time loop. And yeah, then I've also also been developing a game about time loops. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's kind of strange that the pandemic mm. has made some of the sci-fi things like so boring mm. that it's not li really anymore actually the the kind of the distant story of something mm -hmm. happening like that zombie apocal mm -hmm. apocalypses are not that kind of oh weird no. anymore. We're mm -hmm. like oh yeah oh yeah, yeah it feels like that when you go outside yeah, yeah pandemic <laughs> fall of civilization <laughs> yeah oh no. oh no I hope that there will be a moment where we can get back to the normal thing that that games and movies will make <laughs> us feel like strange worlds and not the opposite. <laughs> yep, yep. The escapist fantasy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so also, uh, if you pay attention here now to the translation accuracy below the xenoglyph name, so it says that 23% for the first tier, 47 for the second tier, and 78 for the final tier, and then it also says translation complete. So mm -hmm. we kind of like use that to signal that the translation accuracy is still like less than 80%. Like yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. fifth of chance that we got this wrong. Yeah. Will that kind of come back to the player also that it's not, that the final thing is not kind of final, mm. that you kind of misunderstood something? No, it will never be 100%. And this yeah. will, this annoys some players so much because they kind of like want to complete everything. Mm -hmm. And, and this game- I also wonder like that should be like super difficult to do mm -hmm. in order to kind of point out to mm. you that well you missed something because mm. the translator wasn't mm. that correct then. Mm. Oh no, there's <laughs> more enemies. Yes. So, yeah. But to me it was kind of like the big part of cosmic horror is that we cannot truly understand these things mm. and also the kind of like whole alien civilization like how could you just kind of like fully Rosetta Stone their language without understanding anything about mm. their culture Magic. Mm -hmm. and also kind of like the the backstory of the aliens is also that they they are hive mind so they co communicate mm. telepathically 
and then this one faction had to invent language because they lost connection to the hive mind. Right. So so it is also like, you know, they are inventing their own language mm. and, and kind of like what kind of language did they even have uh, before before this kind of like severing of, of, of the kind of connection. So they kind of like literally had to invent this language, but they would still probably have concepts uh, from this hive mind era uh, where they were just all connected, all understanding one another. Yeah, but did you, when you were a child, yeah. this goes into personality, <laughs> very personal stuff, but w did you invent your own languages? Like, did you have like a secret code with your friend or something like that? I don't know how common it is for kids. I, I actually didn't. Um, no, okay. I didn't. Uh, but I did write a lot of long stories. Oh, there's by the way, another cipher there. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. There we go. Yeah. All right, let's collect that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, two? <laughs> mm. <laughs> two out of ten. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's... it's um. I, as, a, as a kid, I did have mm. a secret language with my friend, Ooh. with Ooh. like these glyphs. Ooh. I guess it was because my friend was <laughs> into some literature stuff. Mm. Uh, but uh, kind of mm. makes it makes it kind of familiar mm. uh, pattern. I guess a lot of kids would do some mm. kind of secret stuff. I, I do appreciate kind of like uh, in my adult life the conlangs, the constructed languages. Ah. Yeah, like yeah, they're yeah. they're really fascinating, and especially kind of like made the Dothra Dothraki really popular and before that Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. yeah. and then Klingon. So there are a lot of these kind of like examples of constructing a language, but we kind of like definitely didn't want to construct a language. Yeah. Uh, it would have been too much effort and kind of like it is not per se a lang kind of like for them, it's it's a little bit like kids learning to make their own kind of like secret language uh, because before that they didn't know what it means to have a language. Yeah, You're yeah, just yeah. thought and presence and yeah. connection with all these other uh, members of your species. That's very interesting narrative. Mm. Uh, but then I wanted to share an example uh, from the latter part of the game where we kind of like see the shifting in this kind of like narrator uh, of behind these texts. So we start from a tier one that it says, I see. And now it's into a lake of madness. It would have been better if only pain and kind of like the full translation is I see through a rear view mirror darkly plummeting into a lake of madness that scarred the underwater depths. It would have been better if certain fiends had never been born. Mother lied about the joy. There is only pain. And clearly this, the tone of the text is very different. It seems to be talking about a specific person and their specific experiences instead of like we uh, kind of like mentioned in the previous one and kind of like maybe these these things that the kind of writer is telling about is also maybe something very personal to Celine. So, like one theory could be based on this that Celine learns the alien language and starts writing to herself. Mm. Mm. And here you can also see the uh, ignore the translation complete because I had to use debug to get this. But kind of like here you can see that translation accuracy on tier one starts at ninety nine percent, and then it goes down to one percent. So it's actually mm. saying that the last tier is the least reliable. Oh, so we're also kind of like again That's putting putting people. Pu yeah putting putting that kind of like unreliability oh, about wow. these in there, hmm. and again there's lots of kind of like more personal and a little bit maybe medical horror things like incisions, corpse in a wheelchair, unwanted as the kind of like those little bit maybe these are the final translation but we're not sure yet layers. But yeah, then the data bank entry. So actually now if you press that, mm -hmm. yeah, and then you navigate all the way there. So here you you can see all the enemies that you've uh, you've killed, all the items that you've collected. There's a whole bunch of things. And here you can also see all this, those audio logs that you've, mm. you've collected and you can re-listen to them if you want oh, to. Wait. There we go. Mm. Have to listen to that mm. and play it. But yeah, so the data bank, literally Celine is a scout. And we kind of like wanted to make sure that there was these uh, player verbs that uh, kind of like um, supported that. So she's not a space marine, even though she does adapt to these conditions really well. Mm -hmm. But kind of like her primary function is to be a scout, to be a scientist, mm. to log these things that she encounters and kind of like date that, take that data back to the evil corporation that she works for. No. Lovely corporation, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you kind of like log these things into the data bank and through that you can learn what they do. So kind of like a lot of the times we kind of like do uh, kind of like there's gameplay relevant information. So if you go back up to the hostiles and there you can see that lizard dog thing that you fought, 
it kind of like tells you in the first paragraph a uh, little bit kind of like how it fights. So it gives you a little bit of gameplay hints like, oh, okay, this is what to prepare for. Uh, there's 50 slots. Yes, oh. there's, there's lots of enemies there. Mm. And yeah, so there's pro both kind of like gameplay, gameplay relevant information mm -hmm. and, and also kind of like backstory to the planet and, and lots of other things. We're mixing layers here as we're going to go see. Uh, so again, you can see that the data is also partially ob obfuscated by these error messages. So a lot yeah, of I times you that. see those uh, all caps like unknown reference. Mm. Uh, and again, here we're doing the same thing that we're kind of like signaling that this information is incomplete and maybe it's also unreliable. So mm. sometimes the computer cannot even make sense of what is it being scanned. Mm. And that's maybe where the cosmic horror comes in that even the computer is like this, this defies all laws of physics. We, uh, our sensors cannot make sense. So the research progress in the mm -hmm. bar in this view would yeah. be that the more I kill them, yes. the more info I get. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And for items is that how many times you've uh, picked them up or scanned them. Right. Okay. So now I'm more motivated to yeah. pick them up as well. Yeah. There are some yeah. items though, like for if you, um, I think in the equipment menu. Oh no, it's in the upgrade. Sorry. Uh, it's been changed. Yeah. So these are research completed immediately because you can only pick them up once. All right. Yeah. So had to, had to kind of like adjust some of these, but mm. kind of like once you ha once you start putting items into your data bank, it feels weird not to put everything into the data bank, mm. even if they kind of like there is uh, no kind of like same set of progress that you can make with them. It's optional to pick them up. So is there any there's mm -hmm. is there any bad effects that I would get from? Mm. Well, if you something up. Uh, well, <laughs> if you don't pick up certain upgrades, uh, you will be blocked from further progress. Further, yeah, exactly. uh, but like there is, there are some items that are very risky, so mm. uh, they can give you malfunctions mm. uh, that kind of like um, debuff you in a way. Uh, so until you achieve the kind of like the conditions needed to repair that mm. malfunction. So there are some items that are risky, but most most are just kind of like positive. Kind of depends maybe on what the R and Jesus <laughs> has to say on that mm -hmm. day. Uh, but yeah, so the research progress, yes, tracks uh, your kind of like en encounters with that item or enemy. And most most of them have uh, similar to the Xenoglyph three tiers to unlock. And they're usually very, very specific tiers that I'm going to talk about a little bit when we get to the example phase. And here we're also, again, mixing those story layers. So we start most entries with very grounded sci-fi. And then we start mixing in psychological and cosmic horror aspects. And also Greek myth is heavily involved here. So in the naming of key items, as well as enemies and bosses, like I dug deep to find things that were kind of like Greek mythy, but also a little bit ours. And there was also like medical, medical stuff as well, for reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so here's the full data bank entry that we were looking at earlier, the Kerberon, the lizard, tentacle ta dog, a lot of people call it like that. And we can see that kind of like each uh, tier unlocks a new paragraph of text. So yeah, now you've already got the two tiers and right. then you've only got the third third one left. Mm. And you can see there's kind of like also like a little bit of fluff data there on the left with the classification in fauna and then the kind of like a full scientific name of the Crinisaurus Kerberonia mm. and all that. <laughs> Lot had to do a lot of kind of like just um, vomit up random scientific names. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come up with those names then? Uh, well, I think uh, I think Crinisaurus was something to do with hair. So kind of like the tentacles reminded me of hair or right. mane. So yeah. it's kind of like a mane source, like a kind of like basically just taking a lot like how people named the fossils yeah, and kind of yeah. like the different species of dinosaurs. Mm. And there, there is kind of like all this Greek and Latin like um, terminology, kind of like, uh, was it the pterosaurs? Mm. Ptero is literally like, or is the word for wing. So it's mm. winged lizard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I basically just kind of like haired lizard. Yeah. <laughs> so this is haired lizard and Kerberon, of course, is uh, derived from Kerberos, mm. the famous uh, underworld guardian with mm. the three heads. Uh, so that was kind of like my reference to the kind of like dog-like nature of it. So Pro it was just kind of like looking at its 
kind of like uh, what what it'll look like, trying to take the most significant visual aspect of it, mm. and then just Googling, like, what is leg f in Greek, or sometimes <laughs> in Latin. I tried to <laughs> lean more on the Greek because yeah, that was yeah. more relevant. I think yeah. there were a couple of Latin ones that also got in because they were just sounded better. Yeah, mm. so some of the decisions for aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a lot of it. Like, you yeah. don't want to have a word or name for anything that is too hard to, uh, like, pronounce, yeah. even if it was scientifically more accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or kind of like, this is how it actually actually be named yeah. uh, even though this is a completely fictional animal so I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. who would come to me and well actually I could see someone like a youtuber <laughs> that is a researcher go through oh, yeah. this researcher uh, reacts yeah. to eternal names yeah, yeah, like yeah. oh yeah. this is this is pure but I love it how, how it's like to open up that uh, even naming things have aesthetics uh, mm. as a background for the mm. decision making so yeah it is kind of like it has to be kind of like short and snappy but also mm. evocative like Kerberon I think achieved that it was one of the first ones that I worked on Mm. Uh, because it was it is the basic like you know the mob enemy that you fight a lot and it, w it was kind of like early on that it had this kind of like wolf-like pack behavior and that's mm. where I got the kind of like dog and well what is the most famous dog in kind of like Greek yeah, yeah. myth and yeah. we, then I just kind of like okay how can I twist because you don't want to go out and say it's Kerberos no, like that's yeah. a little that bit too much too boring yeah yeah so then we were kind of like just twisting it twisting it twisting it and then Kerberon came out of that yeah then I also wanted to also make sure that the species name that you could kind of like like we never say the like T-Rex we don't ever say the full name mm, yeah, so yeah, I kind of yeah. wanted to make sure that the designation the kind of like nickname mm. could be derived from the species name so Crinisanos mm -hmm. Kerberonia Kerberon yeah mm -mm -mm -mm. that's that's how you call your mates Kerberon Kirby Mm. <laughs> Kirby, <laughs> I should have called it Kirby. Oh, Kirby. Oh. <laughs> so, in terms of process-wise, you would just Google these well, things I, like, as, I, a, as a question. As a narrative yeah. designer, half my time is on Wikipedia, and the other half well, on synonym yeah. dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't like use uh, in-house like these books. I when I was a kid, we had mm. this like full set of books ah, of the encyclopedia written in the seventies. I don't know if that would be even like interesting source for instead of wikipedia to mm. go through like old, old information yeah yeah, yeah i kind of like trust that in internet has the most up-to-date <laughs> and more easily <laughs> searchable like if yeah, books yeah, yeah. had search function i might use them more yeah, yeah but they don't be. they don't that's true mm. uh but yeah so kind of like here on oh the no. presentation screen we can still see that and you kind of like see that the first paragraph is kind of like quite you know grounded sci-fi we talk about what it looks like we talk about those tentacles that we've seen quite prominently. We talk about those longer tentacles that it kind of like uses as a warning that it's about to attack. Mm. And that's that's literally what it says here. Like the longer main tentacles are most likely used for sensing environment and for threat displays. And then uh, the creature attacks mainly with, and this is where we get to the unknown reference. Mm. Uh, so one thing that I struggled a lot with was kind of like, how do I describe this these bullets and beams and everything that the enemies shoot at you mm -mm -mm. Uh, because they also they they don't move as fast as normal bullets yeah. uh so and then i thought about like okay maybe the atmosphere on atropos is different and then i kind of like okay how do i describe this energy because they kind of like they do behave the same way they sometimes have different color but bullets roughly always work the same way mm. Uh, there are different shapes of bullets, but kind of like the bullets, the regular round bullets, they kind of like come at you at a certain certain pace in a certain pattern. Uh, but then I was like, well, we can just obfuscate that. And it's in more interesting to leave that. Like if I just start explaining like it's this type of energy and interacts mm -hmm. with the atmosphere like this, causing like a flaming reaction. And that's how it hurts you. And then I thought like, no, just no, let's just kind of like leave that open. And then we decided that we started using these error messages to obfuscate information in the databank entry. So you can see that it attacks mainly with unknown reference energy. So mm -hmm. we're kind of like, we say that it's energy, but then we're kind of like obfuscating what type of energy yep. and kind of like letting players then maybe fill in the blanks themselves. And later you can see that we're kind of like taking like even bigger chunks of text away. So in the second paragraph, it says kind of like, um, as a carnivore database mismatch kills its young in such extreme cases, like there's clearly maybe a bigger part of the sentence missing there. And we start to kind of like, we also made sure that maybe in the first tier, there would only be one corruption mm -hmm. uh, or kind of like missing reference. But then kind of like the more you get deeper into things, like the second paragraph already has two errors. Yeah, yeah. And then we get to the third tier, which is my favorite, because this is where the game completely kind of like, throws the science fiction out the window <laughs> and it has this kind of like weird poetic 
uh, like snippet in it with it kind of preceded and um, like afterwards there's this kind of like jumbled sense of letters. So you get the sense that it's a, it's as if it was picked from somewhere and kind of like it is kind of like almost broken at the end and mm. the beginning. And these are kind of like uh, very much similar in style to the um, kind of like the science fiction books that you find in the house. I don't think we ever mention names uh, here, but kind of like the style is very similar to those science fiction books. So again, you can be like, okay, the computer is just broken, or this is some kind of weird thing that Celine has concocted in her mind. And when she can't kind of like um, come up with further information about the curve rules, she just fills in a blank from these books that she used to read. And there is a kind of like a thematic uh, kind of like similarity. So that kind of starts with wasn't likely to change her ravenous pursuit. So there's this kind of theme of these kind of like pack animals hunting and that kind of like then translates over to this piece of prose that you find at the end of each of these um, uh, data bank entries. And already kind of like in the second paragraph, there's a little bit of that slippage into like weird territory, uh, like the end of, end of that sentence or uh, paragraph says plausible scenarios include scarcity of resources, failure to bond despite offspring's successful imprinting, self-preservation, boredom. Mm -hmm. So kind of like that, that it would, this kind of like species would kill its young mm -hmm. it, and kind of like what, how the computer is able to make sense of that just from you like fighting it. It's mm. a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. And also like a lot of these things that we come up in the kind of like second paragraph start to kind of like get deeper into that psychological territory that there are these weird references to things that kind of like are around those same themes that Celine is struggling with. I, I love it. So like, let me just mm -hmm. uh, kind of repeat that, that mm -hmm. uh, you were first trying to maybe think about the uh, fuller information, but then you realize that it could be interesting to mm -hmm. have these kind of uh, blanks yeah. there titled mm. certain way uh yeah we were initially kind of like uh always always kind of like knowing that the ship is damaged in the crash it cannot be fixed mm. and kind of like everything that the ship does which is also to analyze all these enemies is is going to be broken mm. we were considering like would there be ways to fix it and kind of like maybe fill in that data mm. but that was kind of like okay too out of scope no mm. just too much too much for not Kind of like you, people don't read data bank entries. Most players don't read oh, data bank a entries. Lot of, <laughs> a lot of players. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but so then it was just kind of like this interesting, we were also playing around with this kind of like obfuscation of information with these errors in the in-world text, like the pop-ups that you were seeing. But that was just kind of like too much because in combat, you just want to know what the item does, pick it up and know immediately. But here, because this is kind of like non-essential information uh, and players usually choose to go here out of their own volition, uh, we could kind of like play around more with the narrative and more kind of like more text, more weird things happening. I, I really appreciate that, that there is a more kind mm -hmm. of a, um, more work done into the narrativizing also the information, mm -hmm. that there is a story behind the, mm -hmm. the data banks, not just that mm -hmm. they are there to fill and they're there to inform because a lot of the uh, earlier mm -hmm. games has this problem that mm -hmm. the narrative stuff is just informative. Mm -hmm. There wasn't all uh, writers in the team. So, so they didn't have skills for that. It's not easy mm -hmm. to do it. So uh, like for me, for instance, as I referenced the Bioshocks o audio mm. logs, first it just felt in the game that because you, you, got, you, you got used to that with previous mm. games that they're probably not significant at all. Mm -hmm. But then, they, then you pick up some of the stories and later mm. the story continues and that kind of intrigues, intrigues you to follow them more. Mm. Because it, it is sometimes more interesting than mm. the main story, mm. and and uh, and more emotional. I guess that's something that mm. games haven't done that well in the past. That there is an emotion in mm. there. So I really, I really love this mm. um, narrative tool of broken information. Mm. Uh, d d do you have any reference games that would do the similar kind of things? That uh, I don't remember at the moment. Chat, if you know any, please <laughs> say say there. Uh, Probably but something. But yeah. But yeah, you you said that through that through the process you kind of came up with mm -hmm. this, so that it wasn't through a reference. Yeah. To to me, it was just very much derived from the cosmic horror, like the this planet. Like if if we tell you everything, what these things are, what they do, how they function, that kind of like deprives you of the mystery yeah. and the horror. Like your imagination will fill in the blanks mm -mm. way more efficiently than we could describe something like truly horrific. Yeah. If it's it's way more interesting and you know and then then it attacks you with its 
blank. Yeah. And yeah. then you will probably, you know, imagine something, you know, way more horrifying. Yeah. But we did want to kind of like, um, s- kind of like put that interesting like edge of like science fiction tries to always figure out how things work mm. and kind of like how these, you know, alien civilization putting together the puzzle, their technology, learning everything about it. But the cosmic horror is very much about the unknown, the horror of the mm. unknown. And you mm. cannot know. Yeah. That, that is the true horror. Like, no matter how much you try, you cannot know. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of like the data bank is that perfect place where we explore that. Kind of like, we try to explain some of the stuff. And it was also fun for us, kind of like as narrative designers. So, okay, so we have this thing that seems to fly, but it also like almost behaves like it swims. How do we, how do we kind of like, we want to kind of like, sometimes we wanted to lampoon these things almost mm. like mm. we even point out like stuff in the data bank interest. Like, yeah, we have no idea how this thing flies. Yeah, It's a little bit like the bumblebee problem, but in space, <laughs> like how is this thing able to move? We have no clue. Or we mm. kind of like, maybe they are able to manipulate space time. Mm. Like maybe that's how it does it. Uh, that's how we do it. Yes. I mean, we <laughs> manipulate the yeah. space. So, so, so we kind of like, we, we, put forward these hypotheses on how these beings could work mm. or how they how they kind of like live out their lives but they're very much like hypotheses and there's clearly like missing information or sometimes like way too much information like how does it know about its young we never see the Kerberon's young mm. how does it know that it kills the young in, right. out of boredom like mm. how does it even know that these are these things capable of boredom so mm. sometimes the computer is like clearly reading into stuff that seems like it's implausible for it to know. At least you, as the player, mm-hmm. have not seen like, oh, mm-hmm. here I can see Kerberon killing its young, and it's bored. Yes, okay, let's log that in the databank. So the computer is clearly deriving this information from somewhere, but you never see it. So you also kind mm-hmm. of like, how does it? How does it know? I wonder though that we're so used to kind of uh, this uh, what is it, submission of disbelief. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we is like, oh yeah, there must mm-hmm. be something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or that since this narrative is that you mm-hmm. very early on you know that okay, so uh, this has happened mm-hmm. to me already. Yeah. I this was like my corpse, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it gives a bit more leeway for for mm-hmm. things to be weird, mm-hmm. at least for me. And yeah. there it actually exactly the the bumblebee problem in space based on the structure of its wings wings it should be physically unable to support its body weight Mm-mm. so this is this is the space bumblebee mm. <laughs> all right yeah. yeah uh but yeah, i also wanted to talk about the weirder things that the computer cannot really understand and this is an example of a data bank entry of an item that we deemed cosmic so there are kind of like things that are clearly created by the alien civilization and then there are things that are alien to the aliens that's how Mm -hmm. harry wanted these kind of like things to be represented this is also one of the devices that is not really alien tech uh, but something that there's specific fear of this kind of eye like uh yeah stryptophobia yeah yep must be horrible for those people yes we we didn't oof, yeah if you ha- hate tentacles and tryptophobia <laughs> you have tryptophobia this might not be the game for you <laughs> mm. it is a tool to use uh, yep, yep. Uh, to to impact people mm-hmm. mm. but yeah so uh here we have a kind of like a cosmic what we call a cosmic item and again it kind of like starts fairly easy or kind of like you know it starts in ground sci-fi an artifact of unknown origin with a hand-like shape with multi-jointed bone sinew held together with unknown error its fingers curl every time you deliver the final silence by your hands okay now it's getting weird squeeze the trigger the heart the flesh when offerings are deemed worthy then unknown error spreads covering you with promise of release a laughter in a rush of breathless sinking so clearly something has gone terribly wrong there <laughs> it's uh, it looks like the computer has tried to like parse what it does but then it goes in this weird horror poem direction mm. and it gets even worse in the second tier like maybe maybe that was just a fluke but no in the second tier is like disintegrating each reality corrupted text a grasp exceeding conscious corrupted text i strangled myself corrupted text <laughs> ecstatic asphyxiation <laughs> so there were kind of like items that we clearly wanted didn't want to explain because their nature by their nature they should be more than anything of our technology could understand like it tries it clearly tries but maybe something interrupts the process and overwrites it with something or this is the closest thing with human language that we could describe how this thing works Mm. which is also pretty horrifying 
And then there's also uh, the boss entries, which are slightly different in format. Uh, this was one of my favorite typos ever when I was writing this kind of like undefined error. And then I accidentally, accidentally wrote undefined terror. And I was like, <laughs> yes, let's keep that in. <laughs> so kind of like the idea is that the bosses send a signal. Uh, mm. uh, this isn't kind of like very much uh, heavily implied in the narrative, but they kind of like send their signal and that's how you can kind of like always find them. And then the kind of like more you fight the boss, you can start to decrypt the signal. And again, it's very much similar to the writing that you see in Xenoglyphs. There are a couple of words that stand out, but this one you can like maybe fully never translate the same way. Like there are partial decryptions and full decryptions, but the full decryptions is that same weird poetic uh, or prosaic uh, tier three that you see in all the other um, kind of entries. So you're kind of like, you know, you don't get that much information out of the bosses. Uh, some people have complained about this. They would have wanted to know more about the bosses. Mm -hmm. But to me, again, they were, I think, way more interesting left un unsaid what they are. Like, mm -hmm. if I if I learned the backstory of Frikey, and it's a tragic figure uh, who uh, got lost on the way to the arm factory, and that's why she has three or something, like, that's... And that kind of like then explains the horror away, explains the mystery away. So we specifically wanted to not explain what the bosses are were mm. about. So I didn't get this into my data bank because I didn't kill it. Yes, yeah. yes. You right. you have yet to fight the boss. Right, yeah. That's still some way away. But yeah, and then there's the final feature, the ship logs. So uh, as we saw, Celine can enter the ship and access the log. Uh, but the entries have become fragmented in the crash, so they're not all available. Uh, and, and then I have trouble going to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, the ship log was quite fun. Again, this was purely narrative space, so we got to do whatever we wanted here. And we decided to do that each ship log would have two versions. And that kind of version that you're shown uh, depends which act you're in. So there is kind of like an act structure, uh, like once you uh, manage to escape the planet, that ends act one, and then you get to act two, which is even where we get even weirder. Mm -hmm. And basically we have uh, for each log, there is an act one version and act two version. And then we kind of like basically evolve these based on players' progress. So there are certain milestones that you reach in roughly certain order that we can rely on. And then we unlock uh, these uh, logs as you reach them. So for example, you unlock, uh, I think the next log uh, when you enter the house or when you kill the boss. So okay. kind of like we know that those two things will happen roughly in this. You can also dash to get away from this. Well, I'm <laughs> just trying to see how how kind of fast I would die uh, with it. So it doesn't uh, yeah. seem that kind of uh, You're now effective. just exploring. Yeah. I'm exploring my limits, I guess. Ah. It annoys me. I typically do play games so that I would not die. Mm. Uh, so for this game specifically, it gives mm. me a little bit more motivation to actually die, to see mm. more of the story. Mm. Which is very fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, and you do get a tiny notification that you've unlocked a new ship log, but most of the times this might happen like in mid combat, like after you killed the boss, you might not be paying attention to anything except like, I survived, I mm -hmm. killed it, yes. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna, we do a lot of mixing of the layers here. Basically all the story layers are utilized across the logs. Uh, but the most fascinating part about them is uh, in the kind of like final final part of the game, which we call Act Three, you get the ability to move between these two timelines, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, but then the logs still stubbornly stay. Like in Act One, you will see Act One logs, and Act Two, you will see Act Two logs. So there is no Act Three is more like a state mm -hmm. and not a timeline of itself. Uh, so it doesn't still tell you like which one of these is the real version of that log. Is any of this even real? Because kind of like, you know, if, if I just see these two logs and it won't tell me which of these is real, you know, how can I, how can I trust either version of them? Uh, so here we have an example of a ship log that uh, Akko there had access to. So we have Celine Vasos, who's the main character, her personal file. So like, like he would be an employee there would be a personal file on you. And it lists, for example, her missions, her proficiencies, also like interesting little notes like psychological profile flagged, 
heterochromia, trauma-induced. So if you notice there that Celine has two different colored eyes, and here it's implied that it's like coming from a trauma. Mm -hmm. So already there we kind of like start to uh, put in a little, little bit of you know, like a for foreshadowing that there is something in her past that is uh, is probably still affecting her. And then if you go to Act 2, now that same file with the same name says that no such employee found. Mm. Mm. And especially Act 2 is, I think, there's a little, quite a lot of kind of like things that imply that none of this is real or kind of like they're specifically very mean almost. Uh, so kind of like it feels like someone is trying to tear you down or mm. tear Celine down. And this is where we also like the deeper you get into the game, the more kind of like we put weirder logs. So the, some of the early logs are kind of like, you know, there are snippets of conversations, there are communications from Astra, uh, kind of like things that you could find in a ship computer. But then there's also this kind of like destroying the last Titan, which is clearly just describing a moment from Greek myth. And oh, wow. I did yeah. It. I didn't die, I just came back from the pit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fall damage. Mm -hmm. um, you do get take some damage, but you don't die die from oh, that's, fall. That's because nice. that would be that would be quite hard. Yeah. Hard, make make the game even harder, like if you died insta died from a fall. Right, right. Oof. So rogue light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this was this was one of my favorite, I think, ship logs because it's also like I think uh it takes this part from uh is this from the US Constitution? But the oracle bent down to the mortal's ear while the titan was screaming and whispered, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of corrupted text. <laughs> and then that becomes in act two. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-aware that all men are uncreated, that they are endowed by their redacted with certain unalienable, 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 that among these are death, despair, and the pursuit of judgment. I just really love that. Mm. Love that piece of text. So again, this has no place being in a ship log, uh, mm. but it is. Mm. And yeah, mm. we just never explain like why, why mm. the computer has these things. And I really love that we get to just kind of like, uh, just kind of like vibe with the theme and the Greek myth and just put these clearly out of place things there, uh, which still kind of like, you know, they speak to the greater themes. Uh, they hint at maybe other kind of like plot developments or kind of like what things are important or what we find important or fun at least. Mm. Uh, but kind of like, you know, we never, never go to the player like, oh, uh, if you finish the secret ending and then you turn around and put in the Konami code, then you will find this piece of information that explains why all of this happened mm -hmm. and why the Greek myth was in your ship log. No, we never kind of like wanted to get to that point. We wanted to get to that point where there was these interesting snippets that you could kind of create your own puzzle out of. There's way too many pieces, but you can make something out of that puzzle. So we never wanted there to just to be one, one picture, but multiple pictures. Mm. So in conclusion, uh, Returnal story was achieved by mixing the genres and the story layers together. And all that story content can be interpreted in multiple ways, I think, largely thanks to that. And the mystery is introduced gradually. In many places, we start with the grounded sci-fi and then we delve deeper into the psychological or the cosmic layers after we've kind of like established this baseline of everything's normal, everything's fine, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. And we kind of like try to do it slowly so you get this sense of maybe you're a boiling frog, that your real and believable environment somewhat uh, starts to kind of like, as you, as you just slowly watch in horror, just shifts into this fantastic and horrifying. And we do that by undermining also the player's confidence in the information that they receive and in reality itself. So we have these unreliable narrators that we signal directly or indirectly. Also, for example, you find in Celine's house like a pill bottle. So hmm. uh, is she even mentally stable? There is hmm. something her psychological profile is flagged, according to Astra. So maybe she's also not the best uh, best person to tell you what is the truth of this place. Hmm. Uh, we use that like quite a lot of symbolism, like motherhood and and kind of like underworld thematics, lots of kind of like death and really just kind of like hor quite horrible things, but I love those horrible things. Mm. And we mix that in with the regular content to create this sense of like unease and almost a dreamy space. Like this doesn't make sense here, but it is here. So why? 
And then we also draw strong pal parallels between the different stories. So there are kind of like things in the severed and the alien story that kind of parallel weirdly stuff that Celine has experienced. There are similar phrases, similar weird things. Both apparently keep seeing the weird astronaut that we didn't even get too much here. But kind of like there are clearly things that the both aliens and Celine have a kind of like a common reference to. And that seems a little bit weird how, how that happens. So in conclusion, to haunt the player, you must leave them with either an unanswered questions or unclear answers. Mm. And that is the end of my presentation. Oh, thank you. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> applause. <laughs> applause, applause. Thank you. And applause for Anna Kaisa for playing yes. through the games. Yes, Flag showing all the stuff yeah, that I was talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's that's uh, not an easy task, but also I'm not that mm -hmm. worried about how awful of, uh, as a player I am. But it's mm -hmm. also quite important for y when mm. you discuss the game, you to also want it. to see mm. the games. Mm. And, 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 and it it's, uh, it's slightly different than the screenshots to actually see it in mm. context. Yeah. Yeah. Also, interestingly, there's that door that you see when you come out of here that you, you don't seem to be able to get to and yeah. can't seem to open. So the, the <laughs> only thing that I the kind of uh, miss that I would like to see the house right now, yeah. since you've been talking I, about I it so I wish I could just give you the, yeah. the <laughs> unlock the <laughs> development <laughs> mode and we yeah, could just yeah, go yeah. there. That we would go there with, with cheats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cheats. Any, anyhow, so really appreciate the game and specifically the narrative in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I do... My uh, my personal kind of uh, pet peeve with games is that they don't as they don't use enough of this kind of fourth wall breaking mm. that 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 would explain us, mm -hmm. for instance, in that grinding games mm. where something comes again and again. Mm. It doesn't seem too difficult, I even though mm. it of course it's a lot of labor, but it could mm. be m used more in the repetitive online games, for instance. When mm. why does this battle happens again, and mm. why is nobody noticing it? It's mm. like they just say exactly the same lines. Mm. So the first uh, moment with uh, Returnal, Returnal already kind of gave me that mm. kind of new. It's not it's not entirely new, but it's mm. it's very powerfully used uh, mm. that that they utilized uh, or you utilized mm. uh, the the kind of talking. time loop together mm. with the roguelike. Yeah, and and the thing is that the uh, me as a player experiences mm. what the the game character are kind of experiences mm. because I die and she yeah. dies, mm. and then then we both kind of remember it. So mm. it's it's a little bit new position for mm. me. Uh, like for instance, I can come back to Bioshock for some reason, mm. but I, I don't specifically like the the way that they reference the lack of uh, free uh, will mm -hmm. in there. Um, it, it is a little bit like uh, preaching. It's too mm -hmm. preachy in, in mm -hmm. the game. But that's exactly what it does. This, this, uh, it does similar kind of thing that mm. it talks to the player that you don't have a free will mm -hmm. because in a game it's it's actually just mm. path that you have to take mm. that the creator has done. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has similarities, but this like we are way kind of there's so many years after Bioshock. Mm. There's so many more tricks that the narrative designers can mm -hmm. do, and I'm looking forward to have like even more that mm. the game talks to me as a player. Mm. And I, I really love that with this concept that we were able to do this thing where the death is part of the narrative mm. that we don't just have to go like, oh, no, no, that didn't happen. Let's just rewind to that yeah, last yeah. checkpoint and pretend that that didn't yeah. happen because that would ruin the story of yeah. you being Nathan Drake, the hero who just has defeated. Just forget the defeated. fact that you yeah. just died. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. And I, I would love to see kind of like, and I think it's been happening more uh, in the recent years that we see that death is being incorporated into the narrative, into the kind of like Movies. logic, logic yeah. of the world. Mm. Uh, yeah. That this is, you did die and mm. these were the consequences and now you're here and now you have to make maybe trek back to your body and get yeah. your stuff back. So yeah, There's a little bit like in the movies, there's a, this gamey mm. narrative telling. I don't know if, if you have been uh, kind of following the, the sci-fi movies, for instance. I can't mm -hmm. remember the name of it, but there is this one action movie where the uh, the soldier dies again and again. Uh, mm. Edge of Tomorrow? Yeah, Edge, Edge of, of Tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. So Cruise, it, is yeah. Very, it is very gamey in mm -hmm. the sense that it borrows from the world of games. Space out of novel. Yeah. yeah. It's also Live, die, repeat. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was one of the references like we, <laughs> were, we were looking at, like... And and it was kind of like also doing that time loop story with a kind of like an your average Joe type yeah. of hero. Right. Uh, but if you think about it, like time loop was mm. ma mentioned quite a lot in the novel. They have mm -hmm. like a genre of it already, and mm -hmm. there's a few of them now in the films. And then now we are also seeing the mm. game. But they're coming like very different way of like method mm. to present yeah. Yeah. this concept of mm. time loop. And then right now in 
in Returnal is obviously very interactive mm-hmm. and it's kind of, it's also new to games but it could be that mm. it could go further just mm. like what novels has been doing Mm-mm-mm. like mm. time loop become a genre and then it now incorporating mm. the writing and mm. now mm. we're seeing that in It's so that in present games. in games that mm. the kind of it feels almost like why it hasn't mm-hmm. been used that much. Uh, it just seems mm. like we, we caught on that same trend, like, you know, 12 Minutes came out, Hades came out, mm. uh, Deathloop came out. It felt like we, we were looking at all these other games that were sl- roughly in the same release slot, and we were like, oh okay, no. we're, we're part mm. of the zeitgeist now, like, everyone's doing time loop <laughs> games, we're doing a time loop it's game. Time but you can't, you can't escape it, because no. you obviously, as a developer, you also we, play we, other we've games. We've locked this in, like, mm. years ago, and yeah. it seems like there are those just weird collective subconscious moments where everyone mm. Mm-hmm. just gets the mm-hmm. same idea well i guess everyone saw edge of tomorrow and other other movies like that and they were like we should make a game out of that yeah one. and even though if you wouldn't do it like uh consciously mm-hmm. when you get consumed by the similar kind of popular mm-hmm. culture uh, products whether it's literature or uh, i don't know like uh, visual novels mm-hmm. movies anything that they impact you in mm-hmm. like together not just mm-hmm. one reference point mm-hmm. so it's very kind of it's fascinating. I alri- also I like the the genre, of course. Mm-hmm. So, it, but it's fascinating to see that it's mm. it's getting it's moving f- mm. forward, and, and that there's the more tricks to do. And mm. then games that are exploring how you can mm. Mm, like showcase that concept of time loop mm. is mm. Yeah, that could be many different ways of how you can show it. Mm. Like Returnal mm. could be one, mm. and imagine like what type of other method that mm. can be incorporated mm. in the later turns. But that was also a really interesting point that if we all kind of like consume the same medias, we start to get these same yeah. ideas. And uh, that's why I think it's important for kind of like game developers and future game developers to kind of like consume kind of like variety of different, different. kinds of media. Mm-hmm. Like if we all in the team like consume the same type of media, we'll just have the same type of I- like ideas. ideas everyone else is having. Mm. But th- at the same time, it's very uh, it's very comfortable because you mm. know what would tick the boxes of the consumers mm. that consume the same mm. media landscape. So it's not necessarily bad to have mm. same kind of similar ideas because they are mm. building on top of and each they're, other. They're easy to pitch to the publishers. Like, yeah. you know Edge of ah. Tomorrow? <laughs> that book <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Pitching-wise. Uh, yeah. But mm. just <laughs> purposefully, if somebody would want to do se- different kinds kinds of things you mm. would have to maybe have different hobbies mm. than the team uh, mm. that the rest of the team has mm. well, it could be that also mm. raise like the di- like importance of diverse experiences mm. yeah. and mm. then diverse point of view that mm. you obviously have to come up with this specific team like mm. years back yeah before present i mean considering how long mm. it takes to make triple a's you mm. have to think about that or get an early access to what mm. could happen in the next future in few day mm. few years on so you have to have a diverse experience and voices mm-hmm. in one team in order mm. to speculate and think about mm. what could come in the next trendy in the mm. future. In right? the chat, there is actually an interesting question oh. about this. So there is a, the lack of decided one story mm-hmm. is super interesting. Uh, did that make the discussions difficult with the narrative team? You kind of surfaced that a little uh, bit. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. because we didn't have one version of the story. Uh, no, I think it were, we were in embracing it so yeah. kind of like we were always discussing it and then we we're kind of like you know okay what is the significance of this and then we're like well i interpret it so that celine sees it like a positive thing and i'm like no 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 the other person like oh it's a negative thing and then we're like can we incorporate something into the game that kind of like supports both of those viewpoints mm-hmm. like maybe they're not in the same uh text but maybe there's one text where kind of like we indicate that celine like this thing and then there's another text somewhere completely differently where kind of like we see that she has a very negative view of these things and that's a very kind of like simplified way that's not how almost any of the text is Mm -hmm. but kind of like there are there are multiple we tried not to make make it so that there would be kind of like one definitive answer to any Mm. any kind of thing but kind of like you know support and vagueness and ambiguity was Mm. the kind of like big word that we used so Mm -hmm. so that kind of like you could find support for we could find our kind of like versions of the story if we just kind of like play through all the content. So th- then we can have these internet discussions like, no, 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 it's not real because of this. And you're like, no, it's real because of this. So mm. it actually like atypical Fandom to production of. process mm. of the, that mm. the disagreement was uh, actually good for your yeah. game and yeah. not bad for your game. Yeah. Encourage the discussion. And, and, the and because we, I think we still adhere to the bigger themes. Mm. So kind of like in loss, guilt, yeah. uh, kind of like this inability to move on. Like you need to break the cycle, not just on the planet, but kind of like 
in your own soul even kind of like you're stuck in this loop uh so kind of like as long as we kind of get here to the themes and that kind of like there is the kind of like the really nebulous quality of tone which is al always the hardest to communicate as a narrative team to the rest of the team like there are things mm. that you just at some point know that this is on tone mm. this fits the flavor of the rest of the you know crazy stew that you're making this will complement things and th then you just know that this other thing doesn't yeah. and then sometimes having to uh kind of go through the logical process of explaining why this one is not on tone while this one is yeah. like you just c get this subconscious feeling for it and communicating like what is on tone and what isn't on tone is the i think one of the hardest things as a narrative designer right because you live and breathe the story every day like you know it inside and out you know what celine likes or would do but mm. the rest of the team might not or they might not know that you know i i i literally imagined the whole alien civilization in my head from their heyday to their kind of like collapse but mm -hmm. there's no way for me to without hive mind to kind of like <laughs> transfer that information to the rest of the yeah. team and i don't want to make them read my 60 pages of fanfic that yeah, i never yeah. wrote yeah. uh but kind of like um how do you communicate as as kind of like um economically as possible like yeah. what is on tone what is suitable in this world what are the limits of it uh that's that's the biggest biggest challenge as a narrative designer so in 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 practical notions, what what were the tools that you like used for the tone communication? Mm, uh, like how did you did you put it somewhere as sentences uh, or? Uh, well, we did have, for example, the timeline. I actually created yeah. like a big poster version of it to, to give the player of the team an idea of like there's this cosmic scale, mm -hmm. then here's this kind of like alien planet scale, and this is like Celine scale, yeah. and these kind of like events are. And then there's also like the problem of like. Potentially she's time traveling or potentially she's mm -hmm. being revisiting these memories. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. But it was just kind of like trying to put these events at least on a scale of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. So actual physical yeah. visual tool. Yeah. And then I, then I was also pointing at it and saying like, uh, ignore this, like, because this also could just not be happening. <laughs> so <laughs> she could have maybe dived in the, in the car crash here. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. so this is all, this yeah. rest of this could be imaginary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's. Uh, well, it's kind of easy in the sense that we had a small team. So I could mm. most of the time just walk mm. up to the people and be like, hey, I wanted to talk about this concept art you made. I thought, like, I wanted to explain, like, what, how does alien civilization work and that kind of stuff. Mm. And then we did do, like, narrative presentations for the whole mm. team. And, yeah, it's it's a lot, of the, a lot of the time in this one, it was just kind of like talking to people and explaining yeah. My, because it's way easier just to absorb that information for most people mm. when we're just like this and conversing. If the I made a few stories in the f what is it the yeah. fire next to fire pit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like if we if we had like a sixty page like document like read through all of this yeah. and then you'll understand it. I did create some kind of like smaller documents like alien civilization, and for each kind of like device that we had to spec or item that we had to spec like i tried mm. to kind of like include little snippets of like why is this like this and what what does this mean in the world and that kind of stuff so i tried to break it down feature level so mm. now no one had to kind of like read like the the alien civilization there and back mm. My my Silmarillion. Mm. Mm. Uh, we're running over time a lot, but mm. we we also started later. But mm. there's another question about why this why uh, about the team. You had a small mm. team, so it's a, there's a benefit right. of that too. Mm. But why was there a small team? Uh, oh, overall, overall. Yeah. Yeah. So there was four members. Yeah. Um. Team. Well, because well, saving we money or <laughs> could you not <laughs> yeah, find more yeah. people was the question <laughs> there's from a, the stream. There's a yeah. Comic strip about well, that. The, uh, there is a, there is a beautiful and complicated art to uh, game budgeting that I <laughs> understand very little of. <laughs> uh, but to me, to us, it was kind of like an idea that we would uh, kind of like, because this was our first kind of like foray into AAA as Housemark. Mm. We kind of like wanted to be kind of like work smart, not hard. So we wanted to kind of like make an ambitious story, but kind of like try to make sure that the scope of it and the storytelling techniques that we used were kind of like, you know, cheaper in the sense like text, very cheap audio second best mm. and then video very expensive mm. uh, so kind of like we were relying on a lot to also work with the environment artists and do the kind of like production design of the world yeah. to kind of like be very evocative and strange and kind of like do half of the storytelling of the world for us like mm. like half of this stuff i almost had kind of like very little input because the artist just kind of like got the kind of like weird vibe mm -hmm. uh, that we were going for so kind of like there is a lot of just kind of like 
immersive like that just that you're immersed in the world mm. and kind of like the sound and the audio that you hear like little bugs chitter that mm. there are these feelings that there are bigger things in the world like there are bigger animals that you're not even seeing mm. but you just hear them and that creates the sense that you're right. on this alien planet so yeah kind of like we were just playing to our strengths uh, a lot just letting letting the teams create these beautiful environments also leveraging the particles to create the hologram statues that we didn't get to now see uh, but they're there mm. Mm. and and just kind of like uh, relying on this uh, like um, th even though they're cheap techniques they can still be used very powerfully yeah. so it's not like you know if you have a lot of text in your game it sucks and it's cheap no mm. it's it's how you use them right, yeah. right, right. and but to play around with those ideas yeah. maybe it was fast faster because mm -hmm. you were in a s smaller team relatively yeah, yeah. so you didn't have to go through like all those complexity of yeah. communication and there was just kind of like uh there was me our writer luke molding uh my boss greg who was the kind of like cinematic and narrative director and then we had uh either a junior narrative designer part uh part of the production and then our cinematic designer who joined us uh for that last last leg of it and it was just kind of like we had we had our parts like Luke wrote most of kind of like the dialogue and Celine's backstory the house sequences I wrote a lot of the world building item names descriptions kind of like mm -hmm. we all had our own uh, territory and as long as we could cover that like everything went smoothly so it didn't feel like we needed more people mm -hmm. we just kind of mm -hmm. like decided to like scale down our content and make it make it in a way that the smaller team could achieve it mm -hmm. but of course the challenge maybe was more that players see this beautiful triple a trailer and maybe their expectations are like oh it's gonna <laughs> be like god of war and there's gonna be like 100 hours of content and we're oh. like no it's it's there's there's different levels of triple a games like right. there's this production value and graphics and audio but then content wise like i'm personally of the mind that i don't want to play 100 hour games anymore mm -hmm. i'm busy mm -hmm. uh okay. yeah true. and and there could be just just as much kind of like beauty and joy and horror and fun to be had in like a 12 hour campaign there is in a compared to kind of like a hundred hour slog of grind and everything mm. some 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 games manage to make beautiful 100 hour um content games but like i'm i'm not sure i'm still like in the mindset that i want like i very rarely at these mm. times kind of like want to play a game that takes us more than 20 hours of my time yeah, just yesterday i was uh, at the finnish museum of games and mm. we we're talking about noita which is yeah. exhibited there and we had one streamer joining the event and he mm. said that he he has banked 1900 hours for the game <laughs> so so respect. It's, there, there is a lot of the streamers that they really heavily played. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, I guess, uh, roguelike mm -hmm. is also as a mm -hmm. as a genre uh, something that could afford that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many uh, beautiful questions by students also from our pre um, pre assignments. Uh, but I think that there is one thing that I would like to ask you of as a, as a last one, unless mm -hmm. so if you have something that you would. Well, also I think we're looking at the same list. Uh, so right, I guess yeah. we have to choose the <laughs> one question because so, we're running out so of time. What what was the proudest moment of you for the development of Returnal? Oh, that's oh, a good question. Yes, that's a, that's a very. <laughs> good I think I probably one. would have chosen the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, there's so many, so many good moments. There's so many good moments. Can you can you yet even reflect that? They're all just big mess of like happy moments. No, mm. I and think also because there was COVID nineteen yeah. environment yeah. shift it's happening. It's, so it's it very hard very to remember <laughs> anything about twenty twenty. <laughs> like like as a discrete, th yeah. there is just a big blob in my brain that is twenty twenty, and we You're try not, not to poke at it too much. Um, How did it feel like to get the game of the year? Ah, that the that was award. That was amazing. Oh. <laughs> that was uh, kind of like oh, somebody recognizes that kind of like this weird thing that we made mm -hmm. is <laughs> is beating all the other beautiful and well-made games that make like at this point I'm at just like getting the game out is a miracle. <laughs> getting oh. recognition on top of that feels like you're just getting cake on cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Torta, as we say, but like yeah. it's still it's still lovely mm. um, because mostly I've been following like Reddit and Twitter and just kind of like yeah. always keeping an eye on what the fans think and there's just mm -hmm. like that to me is enough just getting the fan feedback mm. and finding those like even if there were five people who loved this game and only five i'd be just happy that they found it and we made a game that like yeah. sings for them right. yeah. but then getting like that big recognition from a big kind of like of uh, what do you what is the kind of like faction entity thing mm. <laughs> that big this group is of people yeah, yeah group of big people group yeah of it's it's hard when as a narrative designer you lose the words and then you're like i do <laughs> words for a living <laughs> uh but yeah so when when one of those kind of like 
gives you and they have the prestige and there's probably been a lot of kind of like battles inside like which game should be the game of yes. the year and mm. that we won out of that one like mm. oh that's that that always always warms my heart but yeah c congratulations for an amazing work and mm. uh, we'll look forward to follow your path of uh, works that <laughs> will come in the future as a narrative designer looking mm -hmm. forward to all the new tricks that you mm -hmm. can develop can we now see the whole thing there, there is uh, a the live illustration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, we can have the camera switched. Uh, so I followed mm -hmm. the session, of course, our rehearsals, mm -hmm. and then follows. <laughs> There's Anna Kaisa playing the game. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, there the the lasers. Uh, yeah, yeah, the laser scene, and then you know, oh, like I'll, I also try to illustrate how, how the stories get traveled around and then discovered yeah. by the players. And there's oh, yeah, a puzzle, the puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces, <laughs> and multiple interpretations. I really like this part about multiple mm. interpretations, where players can just not just passive player mm. but they're like more of a discovery and mm. a lot of theories mm. uh, like some theory makings and there's four narrative team unfortunately yeah. i don't know <laughs> the face of your team so i just have right there but and then they I'll look exactly like them no. <laughs> and this image it will be shared on our social media and of mm. course we consider mm. it to you if Evie, and then Aww. like more of that and then yeah i, I especially like the uh, stories within the stories mm -hmm. discovery and narrative design mm -hmm. team behind it and then a bunch of wikipedia mm -hmm. uh, findings that you have been triggered oh yeah yes that that's that's exactly year. me like I, I just need to take a <laughs> screenshot of that and yeah every time anyone asks what do i do daily basis and like yeah. that and and there's like, a background oh there's mm -hmm. Yeah, and then overall, like I, I really was, f I was fascinated by your love of game narrative and stories mm. and game design. Um, so that's definitely the takeaway from this. Yay. Yay. Yeah, and then hopefully I was able to illustrate that well mm. throughout this session. I'm pretty sure. So we're gonna share the image at our Discord channel, where you also can have a chance to win on the mm. raffle to do some interesting tasks there. Some. Uh, very nice uh, pieces of Returnal swag. We thank Evi for this session. Mm. Uh, sorry for all the troubles <laughs> in no. the beginning. No, no. That's the season of, of uh, all the technology uh, mm. things helping us. Typically, we would have a crowd here yeah. to, to watch our mm. uh, sessions. Oh, please show some of the stickers. There's some oh, yeah, beautiful the stickers, stickers, also stickers are here beautiful st yeah. for you to get. So mm. join our Discord channel. Uh, we might get Evie there to also answer mm. questions later. Yeah, definitely love to. And uh, yeah, join for the next session. Uh, in in the December session, we talk about COVID specifically, which also <laughs> yeah. impacted the development of this game. Mm. Um, is it too soon? I don't know, <laughs> but it's it, there's a lot of months already behind us to reflect on that. So yeah, yep. let's let's see you next time and. Mm -hmm. uh, Join us next time for bye panel bye. discussion. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.